Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has supported the show, and in particular those of you who have contributed to the PayPal tip jar. Of course, the likes, subscribes, and shares help a great deal as well. I enjoy bringing you this content, and the contributions help cover the expenses for doing so. I've had a wonderful time chatting with the people on these shows, so much so that I would like to have them back for further conversations. As you listen, if there are any questions or topics you would like to hear us discuss, please post up a note in the comments or send me them directly. I'll pick the best ones and we'll cover them in future episodes. Another way you can get more content is to join the Spirit Aikido online program. There are currently more than 130 videos in the program, with new ones being added every few days. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. Right now I'm releasing a series of videos on training randori. There's a link to the program in the description. I invite you to check it out. Now, on with the discussion. Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. Uh, I'm excited to have Ryan back, uh, Ryan Fujiwara back on the show. I know we did a really great interview with him a few months ago. Uh, people loved it. I enjoyed it. And uh, we, we've been talking a little bit. And one of the great things about this podcast is meeting so many fantastic people. And he suggested to give uh, DJ here um, an interview and, and a, have him on the show for a conversation. So I wanted to have them both back. And I'm going to hand you off to Ryan here to describe sort of their background and give you a little bit of a, of a uh, familiarization introduction to DJ. First, um, thank you again for, for having me. It was a blast last time. Absolutely. And I know that I know that we got some great feedback, so excited to do this again. Um, as I explained in the podcast, the first one that we did, I had been training with Tada Sensei, right? He's a ninth dan and the highest ranking in the world. I was training at his his dojo in Kichijoji, which is west of Tokyo. Uh, three times a week and I would sometimes go to the Hombu every now and then you know and drop in on a Saturday or or a different day that Tata since I hadn't been teaching at his dojo and then you know I'd just been in and out of the place for a few years didn't really find anyone that I kind of liked there everything was just kind of you know I, I don't want to say run of the mill because what I mean by that is that they have to have their own you know Aikido has to be Aikido because it's it's the world um, you know, it's, it's, it's how they have to show Aikido to the world. So there's a lot of, from what I had seen at that time, a lot of people with just their own very, this is Aikido. And, you know, I was looking for something special and I didn't really like a cookie cutter special. approach. Yeah. Well, I guess so. Yeah. I was looking for something special. I didn't really find it. So I stuck with Tata Sensei, but I wasn't happy. There is as great as the, as he is. He's a, he's a great man and a fantastic budoka. You know, he's he's not just like you know guy. That that's a true definition of someone who does budo, right? Tada Sensei. But it still wasn't what I was looking for. Having my background in, you know, karate and kickboxing and and other stuff, it, it, I, something was missing, and I was on the verge of of quitting aikido to be honest. And one of my friends from Australia came over to Japan and. We went down south to a place called Tanabe, which is O Sensei's birthplace for the International Aikido Congress. And it was kind of going to be my, my swan song. And we were going to, you know, train by day, party by night. There's not, there wasn't a whole lot you could have done at Tanabe to party, to be honest. I mean, just maybe some ramen noodles and a couple of beers outside the convenience store. But that was our plan. Well, that's a major party right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's our, that was our plan. Anyway. First day of the Congress, same thing. I think Tissier Sensei was there. And he had a massive following on, on the tatami. And then a guy called Seki did a class. And I was like, wow, this is cool. This is new. This is something that I might be... I was really looking for something different and looking for a, you know, a way to get out of Tata Sensei's dojo where I wasn't happy. And I thought, oh, Seki Sensei, this might be okay. And then that class finished because in those congresses, you do like five classes a day or something, four or five a day. Straight afterwards, you caught a sensei. And his very first ticket, I was like, oh my God, this is the guy. I, I just knew straight away, this is the guy. I think he threw a sidekick or 
or done some kind of like whatever it was that it was just like this is it this is this is the guy dj wasn't there at the congress and i was just like you know it was like love at first sight if that's the word to say hmm. you and found what you were looking for him. yeah i looked him up immediately online and i found that he was teaching at hombu and i went to the very first class after i got back from that one week congress and it was a thursday afternoon at 3 p.m and I get down to the tummy and I see this guy who looks like Jason Statham up the front, stretching like he's an Indian doing yoga. I was like, who is this guy? He just, DJ just stood out straight away. Sam's on and bow. And then he just darts to the front. I was like, I switched on. It was the very first impression. I was like, damn, all right. Serious teacher, serious student. I couldn't help but just, you know, just, you know, like the attraction to watching. And then since I called DJ up for Kemi straight away, I was like, ah, makes sense. Got it now. Got it. And then at the end of the class, like I never, we didn't practice in that first class together, but at the end of the class, like kind of went up and, oh, you know, had some questions and I'll never forget. We started talking about like trying to make Aikido more practical, you know, mm -hmm my background and then just kind of hit it off from there and that was the first class after the congress and we've been uh like brothers really ever yeah. since so what year was that dj uh that was 2008 okay okay october 2008 right i still remember that that first meeting and you know a lot of people, what really stuck out about Ryan is um, how serious he was and um, how sincere, you know, he really wanted to learn. A lot of people say they want to practice via Kota Sensei. He wasn't the first one. And then they realize how hard it is. You know, he expects a lot. And then his students, I wasn't the only one. He had other students that were, you know, very good and so Yokota Sensei expects a lot out of his students, I think. Hmm. So Ryan really stuck around and uh, yeah, we've been like brothers ever since. Cool. Uh, DJ, maybe you'd want to explain your background just a little bit for, for the listeners that who may not be familiar. Sure. Um, yeah. So I was in Japan a little over 18 years. Um, I did Aikido all that time, but I spent one year at uh, Kokusai Budo Daigaku, which is the International Martial Arts University. And when I was there, I did Judo and Kendo and Aikido um, for one year full time. It was a lot of fun. And then I moved back to Tokyo and uh, just stayed at the Hombu at uh, Aikikai, training there. Um, and uh, then uh, my senpai, uh, Olivier Garon, uh, introduced me to Daitoru Aiki Jiu-Jitsu from the Takumakai in Osaka. And I, then I ended up doing that for over 10 years. Um, got my son down there. Um, and then uh, my last three and a half, four years, I practiced every day at the Shotokan Karate at the JKA Sohombu Dojo um and that was incredible so during my time there i was fortunate enough to be able to get four black belts and i got my godan and aikido there i did all my aikido testing at the aikikai either with yokota sensei or at a regular uh test they had you could test with him at his dojo that was at humbu his class ryan eventually became a member of that class it's kind of introduction only yeah and so i society. right <laughs> after years of you know months or even it was a couple of years really right that you were coming to your uh, maybe, How maybe, long? maybe about eight months before you let me join really that soon yeah. so yeah. yeah he was on the express ticket yeah. so uh, I, kept, I kept bugging you like please please let me in let me in yeah i remember so um yeah so um yeah, I was fortunate to stay there a long time and meet some great people. So that's kind of my martial arts background. Cool. And now you're back in Chicago? Right. Yeah, I'm back in Chicago. 
Mm -hmm. um, I got three kids, three sons, and I wanted them to learn English and uh, see American lifestyle, not just Japan. So we moved to Chicago about almost five years ago. Very nice. Really cool. Yeah, well, the, the topic we wanted to dig into today, and this is um, just to let the listeners know, usually what I'll do when, when I have a, a new uh, person to have a conversation with and we don't have any background is I'll have a little pre-interview where we chat a little bit. And I try to keep it pretty short because then when we have them on the show, it the conversation is more natural and, and it's not just a recital of the conversation that we, we had. So we just kind of choose a topic, get a little familiar and then go. When DJ and I chatted, I think we were on the phone for almost two hours. Like we just kept yeah. going and going and going. Yeah. Uh, and we covered so many uh, great things. Uh, we really got on famously. Um, but one thing that, that kept coming up within our conversation that uh, we both thought would be a tremendous topic, which is training to the mental and spiritual stratas of martial arts, but going having to go through the physical solidly. And I think that that this resonates and I, with a lot of martial artists because so many seem to try to get to the, that mental side, which whether it's strategy or mindset or philosophy or even the, what they view as the higher strata, which is the spirituality part of making your martial art entirely you down to, down to your very spirit, but yet kind of taking a shortcut through the physical or, or omitting that part. So um, what, have, uh, what have you noticed, and maybe we'll start with Ryan on this one, about that physical part being the foundation of the mental and the spiritual aspects of martial art training? Well, I'll, let me give you an example from pro wrestling because that was probably the hottest training I've ever done in my life. But those guys who don't forget, they, they're, they're doing Japanese style training. So it's the same across the board, whether it's judo, kendo, not so much Aikido, unfortunately, I don't I have to say judo, kendo, karate, all these kind of Japanese traditional martial arts. It doesn't matter. It's a Japanese way of doing it, which is they do it until you can barely walk anymore. So in the pro wrestling, they would absolutely just destroy me, right? There were times where I'd get off the, the mats and puke. And their reasoning was that when you're in a match and you don't know if you can go anymore, you have to be able to deep to dig deep down and pull out wherever it is from that part inside you that you need to get from get to to be able to finish the match because you got sometimes thousands of people watching you right and if you if you're not able to to finish or if you're not able to um do what's required like you, you're not a professional athlete so that was all down to being in that the toughest of toughest situations being having that drilled into you in training to make you mentally stronger so that when you get to the real thing which in our case would be, I don't know, like maybe a fight or some kind of violent confrontation that you don't freeze up and go, oh, okay, how do I, how do I, what do I do here? Um, and I haven't come across that in Aikido, to be honest, because I think in Aikido, we, are, we only train in our comfort zones. And that's one of the things we can get onto maybe later on is getting out of that comfort zone. But I can tell you from, from the pro wrestling training and the kickboxing training as well, there is no comfort zones. That's true. That's very true. Yeah, I got to agree. I think what Ryan was hitting on is like when I was at Budai, you know, when you would run with the judo team, we would do sprints and it, four men would run on the well, six, got, six people, six men would run on a track at the same time. And the bottom two would have to run laps if you lost. And um, it was always that way. It was like this uh, attrition was a very important, that competition. And so, you you know, after that third or fourth time, you know, next group would go, you would still be winded when they called you up again. And by the end of it, I mean, you, I've seen guys puke, pass out. And, you know, they have, that's called hashiri komi. Right. I'm sure Ryan's familiar or baseball and Nagikomi, which is to throw till you can't do it anymore to exhaustion. And this this is a very martial idea. So 
Also a very you Japanese know, idea. <laughs> it is. But when we're talking about, you know, Japanese budo, for better or for worse, has become kind of the the yardstick, right? The the belts, the rank system, you know, the terminology. So it's kind of because it's complexity and it's uh, uniformity, it's kind of become the gold standard, in my opinion, right? And, um, but you can't forget, like, the reason what makes martial arts different from other spiritual pursuits or um, other intellectual pursuits is the physicality. And that physicality makes the base, right? You can think about it like a pyramid. And, right, and so that base is physicality. And then you would have spirituality, intellectualism as, as walls or um, other sides of that pyramid. But without that base, there's nothing there. And that's what we do. And Aikido is the only martial art that I think maybe Tai Chi where, or Kung Fu, where people get lost in history and philosophy beyond, you know, practicality. And even taking form, like studying form to the point of minutia where applicability is not a factor. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't even think it's just that. I think that studying the form is fine, but form of what, right? People forget the very essence of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like Aikido is kata geiko. Kata, right? It's, it's kata practice. And so, but kata of what? Kata of a fight. It's not kata of a dance. It's not... You know, kata of, of two people sitting around, it's kata of a fight. And so you have to understand. So if you're getting into minutia, it should have some relevance. Karate has minutia. Judo, jujitsu has minutia. And Aikido has super, you know, komakai details, super small details. And it's okay to go there, but you can't, you shouldn't get lost in a forest through the trees, right? You're studying this micro piece and you forget, you know, you're going to catch one to the face, you know. And so a lot of Aikido people, in my opinion, are half clever, which means they're half stupid. And so they'll re they'll hang on to you or give you trouble without realizing how open they are or their stance is dangerous or weak. So that's why it's important to check yourself with some really basic stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, when back when I was competing, uh, I'd have a lot of young, new people come in and say, you know, your experience, you're you're really skilled, you're smooth. I want to get that, and mm -hmm. I say, well, you know, yes, you can get that, but I'll tell you, when you start, it's you're going to be rough, you're going to be clumsy, it's going to take a lot of hard work. Uh, and I would see in many people, they say, well, how about you know, can't you just kind of give me a shortcut there? Like, can't you teach me? They they put it in terms that anybody would agree with like can't you teach me or can't you show me and you know when i when i would study when i look around at things like motivational speakers and they talk about the number of people that will come to somebody and say i want to make a, I want to make a million bucks okay. and the motivational speaker will usually say do you want to have a million bucks or do you want to do the work that it takes to become a millionaire and right. everybody will say i want the million not many of them one in a hundred maybe or a thousand even will say, I'm ready to do the work that it takes to make that million. And, and I think within martial arts, we see a lot of the same thing, which is the sweat and the, the, the grueling part. And, and of course, you can, you can train and get, make yourself sweaty and not actually learn the art. Just be, being physical is not going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. But I think also dressing up in a nice outfit and going into a place that, that you know, looks really formal and, and, uh, and whatnot is not enough either. There has to be that that dedicated physical study with a goal of this has to work for me. And um, if there's one thing about the Aikido world, I think that is a little different than a lot of martial arts that I've run into is the bottom line, did this work? And that yardstick seems to have been kind of removed from consideration with a lot of Aikido practitioners of, you know, they think, well, did I, was my posture really good? did this look cool? Do I feel good about how it went as opposed to will this function if I'm really tested on it? Right. Um, I remember asking uh, a, a guy at Homebrew once, 
And he said to me, he didn't answer my question. I can't remember what, uh, what the question was, but I remember his answer. And his answer was, well, you know what? I'm looking for more than just, does it work? I'm not looking for it if my stuff works. And I should have pursued that, but I just dismissed it and walked off. Sure. But I think a lot of um, people need to get out of the gray zone and it's okay to do Aikido because you want to be a better person, mm -hmm. but I don't think you can hide in the little gray area of, of um, practicality. You know, I think that you can be a better person while also being a better martial artist. Absolutely. You know, I, I think right. and DJ brought up a great point within our, within our discussion, which is um, the idea that you, you actually build that, that mental and spiritual side upon the physical training like it comes out through those physical parts and and as he explained that to me uh and he made a great point about this an analogy popped into my head it's like you can view that you can get to that that spiritual level with something like playing guitar like you can become so into music that you've bypassed or you've gone through the physical part of learning to play and now you've gotten to the point where you're just playing beautiful music without thinking about it. You've gone past the mental part. But if you start playing guitar, thinking that you're going to be Stevie Ray Vaughan or Eddie Van Halen, you're just making racket. And, and you can do that. You can learn that way. But if you take the strings off the guitar, now you're not learning anything. You're just posing. And it's the strings and hearing the notes that give you the feedback of whether you're doing well. And to me, in that physical realm, that's what uke is for. And a good active uke will remind you, no, you're playing crappy music. You need to clean this up. This has got, this has got to sound right. It's got to work right. And, um, and, and that's where I'm, I, I'm often disappointed in, in seeing, and I've run across this quite a few times, especially when I visit, visit dojos or whatnot. Uh, in the past and, and even seminars where Nage will start scorning and scolding Uke for, for not playing along or for not being fun enough for them to play with. Mm -hmm. um, essentially being like, uh, you know, be a beginner Uke for me, you know, or, or <clears throat> pretend like I'm a beginner so you can make my technique look good sort of a deal. Right. Um, so I personally like he telling Uke, all right, you know, tune this up a little bit. Give me some heat. I want to, you know, screw with my technique because I won't break it because I want to make sure it's strong and that I can adapt to the variations that can happen in the chaos of, of a real fight. In, in right. That sense, so, I love to, I, just quickly, sorry. In that sense, I love to take raw beginners in training. Yes, very much so. Um, because they don't move the way that, that everyone else is programmed to. Mm -hmm. And it, it really becomes a nice uh, little bit of uh, research, but sorry, DJ, you were saying? No, I just, you know, I agree. And I think, but I think the real issue here is that these people don't know the first thing about martial arts. You know, when you hear that people are redefining martial arts, look, if you're doing something just spiritual, well, there's great, there's churches and synagogues and temples and mosques, and you can go there for that. And if you want to do something physical, you can go to the gym or run down the block. But martial arts is, Japanese martial arts is based on shin gi tai, right? Shin is kokoro feeling. Gi is gijitsu or technique or, you know, philosophy thought. And then tai is body. But um, everything is based on the physicality in, in martial arts. and. Um, and if people have questions now, uh, does it work? Well, martial arts has those three parts to it, right? And so if it works for one of those things, that's okay. So, um, you know, you Tristan, you mentioned about somebody just going there and getting a good workout. Well, at least they'd be in better shape if they had to defend themselves. Sure. Um, if they were trying to reach a, a deeper spiritual end, well, maybe they can come to some kind of agreement instead of fighting, right? Some, some kind of deeper level where their ego is not involved and they could get out of trouble that way, maybe. But every that's that's like that comes after the base. You cannot skip the work. If there's no sweat in there, then you're doing something else and 
I joined a Buddhist temple when I was 18, went and meditated. It, great. But if, if, you know, it's different from training. And so if we're training, we should, it's not up to these people to redefine it as a strictly spiritual practice. Even if you look at, oh, since they only wrote one book on Budo, on Aikido called Budo, right? You guys have probably seen it. Yep, I've got it. Yep. Right? Well, read the, I was, after talking to you, Tristan, I started looking, I haven't read that thing in years. Yeah, me and so I pulled it out. Incidentally, uh -huh. we were talking about Tada Sensei, and that's the, he's the Uke on the front cover, I believe, that the O Sensei is throwing. Mm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the, young, the young kid that he throws across the room. Right. Um, and that book, the first 30, 40 pages is almost indecipherable to any level martial artist. You know, I took it about as far as you can go. I moved to Japan. I studied with Japanese Shihan in Chicago with Toei Sensei is where I started. So I've been with Shihan for, I don't know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And now learned to read and, uh, and understand Japanese a bit. And okay, I lived there 18 years. I got it. And I read, looked through those pages and it's, you know, talking about the universe. And, you know, it isn't until you get to where he starts demonstrating that you, that he literally says, well, smash the face or strike the ribs. Mm -hmm. So he told us to do this. I use this at my, uh, my Sandan or Yondan paper for my third or fourth Don. You have to write a paper at the Aikikai. And, um, and uh, you Yokota said- when, when you go for a grading. When you go for a grading, when you test. You have for to, any you have of the Don ranks, you gotta write a one or two page paper. And I think it was my son, Don. And uh, I can't remember. But Yokota Sensei had me do it on Aikido and the book of uh, Goden no Sho, the uh, Miyamoto Musashi's Book of Five Rings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there were a lot of comparisons there. And even Yokota Sensei said it was, oh, you know, Benkyo Narimashi. It was good study for him. Because O Sensei says right in there to do techniques hard. And it shows a temi to the face. It doesn't show this mystical stuff. So I don't know, you know, I think they're putting their own mind into it instead of seeing what O Sensei laid out for us. You know, it's interesting you describe that as, you know, a Westerner that, that goes over there. Uh, and I remember covering this ground, you know, I really wanted to dig in and try to get to why is there so much vagary and disagreement and... Uh, kind of mumbo jumbo word salad when it comes to, you know, what was those sensei's message? What it, did it mean? And, you know, I thought, well, maybe to the, you know, cause you hear this a lot, you, you know, the Japanese mind is un, uh, incomprehensible to West, the Westerners. Like if you're, if you're not from Japan, you'll never understand the culture, no matter how long you spent here. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I found interesting was that even native Japanese people who were his students did not comprehend what he was talking about. Um, and to my knowledge, not one person, not one of his direct students really makes a claim to fully understand what he was talking about. So I don't think that that's a, a West or versus East or Japanese to non-Japanese uh, gap. I think that that was a gap between the founder and literally everybody else. And um, Right. But there's, but the, the people in Japan, I mean, you can say what you want about the Aikikai instructors, but they're very serious about what they do. Oh, certainly. Right. They're professional teachers. And but, you know, and you get people there doing that. But here you kind of get people, you know, Aikido is love. They joined on that message in Japan. At least there's a basic understanding like Americans have about baseball. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't you know, I played a couple years of Little League. I don't know much about baseball. But, you know, you know it from being an American, seeing it on TV and stuff. And Japanese know martial arts equals hard work or should. Mm -hmm. A lot of Westerners hear that Aikido, you know, you could turn your partner's energy against them. And, you know, and, and you don't have to be strong to do it. This is ridiculous. You know, I don't know any martial art where you don't want to be strong. Now, being was, uh... stiff is different. I Go wonder ahead, if this is a recent thing because when my father started doing Aikido and when I started doing it, like that was not the way we thought. That could just be us. But it's, I, I wonder, I just, I'm asking you guys, is, is, do you think this is a common trend 
of the last, say, 15, 10 to 15 years that people are, are thinking like that? Because, like, you know, in the 90s, Steven Seagal was kicking ass on in the movies and taking names and made Aikido worldwide famous. I mean, I don't, what do you think? Well, my history doesn't go back as far as uh, DJs or, or uh, even yours, but I do realize that, that in, a, in a community as large as the Aikido community, which is, I think, what, a million and a half practitioners or somewhere in that ballpark, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty big. You don't get a sudden change of Aikido training overall being pretty rigorous and focused, and then suddenly within about a year or two, you get two-thirds of the community that's not breaking a sweat, and they're kind of just doing a little motion practice. So I, something tells me that, yeah, in the last uh, maybe 15, 20 years, it's drifted to that. But I don't know. I think it could have started as back at, far back as the 60s when uh, Osensei was alive. And it maybe it started to kind of wind down in, in some areas after that. Um, and perhaps it was under the influence of instructors that got older and their knees and their body couldn't handle taking ukemi and they got more you know subtle and subtle to the point where new students that came in that wanted to emulate them started to move like old men that were that had bad knees right. i mean it could be something that simple and and a, a couple of generations and what would what would you, uh, an aikido generation be maybe five six years when you have a new, a new somebody comes in new and gets to black belt or somewhere in that ballpark so you got three or four generations where the, the age, average age of Aikido practitioners is gets older, shifts from maybe 20s to 30s up to 50s to 60s. You know, that martial arts is going to look totally different when the, the age profile goes up into senior citizen range. Um, you know, I see that with judo too. You know, I know some really great judoka that are in their 50s and, and they, don't, they don't do judo like a 20-year-old or, you know, 25-year-old. That's a young man's martial arts. <laughs> it definitely is. I utmost yeah. respect for judo. I love it. But uh, the, the, the human frame is not built to handle that for extended oh, periods no. of time. Well, you can see why, where the Gracies decided to, to tweak it to make it something for everybody. Sure. Yeah. And th there's a place for that, you know. Um, DJ, your thoughts. Well, I was just going to say, first off, there's a couple like fundamental differences between Aikido and other Japanese Gendai Budo, right? Modern Budo, right? Stuff that came in the late after the late 1800s, right? So the stuff that we think of as Japanese martial arts, right? Judo, Kendo, Karate Do, Aikido, right? Only Aikido doesn't have some form of competition or Shiai, right? Some form of Kumite. Right. You said the taboo word, my friend. <laughs> yeah. The C word. Well, and, but I don't think this is necessarily a weak point. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just a different point. And so first off, martial arts, you know, should should go zero to ten. Right. And your martial art, my martial arts, I try to zero to ten are two most important numbers in martial arts. Right. Mm -hmm. And because that's uh 10 being or zero being completely relaxed and 10 being extremely tense what well, power put in right so it's only at that last second do things snap right or the throw or the choke mm -hmm. right or the shibuti right with the hands so um right and so understanding those numbers so your martial arts and so if you think of like yoga at a zero Tai Chi, and then Aikido coming up around, you know, three or four, right? And then going in their boxing and jujitsu or, you know, full contact karate, whatever, right down to 10 being a street fight. So these numbers, you know, understanding these extremes is important. And, but not having competition allows certain people, older people, a chance to practice at a different level. And I think that's fine. But what you can't do is skip the martial arts part of martial arts, mm -hmm. right? Aikido is still a martial art within that martial arts world. And it follows the same rules of hard work, of sincerity. And you can't just, you know, babble on about spirituality. You have to, sure. you know, uh, do something. And Aikido, you can hide. That's one of the differences. Kendo, you can't hide. Judo, karate, you can't hide. Because even if you're doing Kihon, you can see who stinks. 
Yes. If you see yeah. people's karate keyhole and you see right away, I'm sure you can see it, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't care how many kumite or whatever you think you're winning. You don't know what you're doing. You can kihon is the start. And Aikido kihon is in the waza. And so people hide it. And people don't know what Aikido kihon. Karate kihon is clear as day. Yeah, you can you can read that body language. And I mean, that's having competed for almost 30 years. You know, you can tell the way somebody holds themselves, the way they use their eyes, the way that they control space, which is, I mean, it's really just a kind of ultimate body language thing of whether they have that martial spirit or not. And I'm or not even talking martial snap. spirit, just being a thug or just being a ruffian. Yeah, okay. I'm talking about true level of control. Right. Yeah. I'm talking, you know, Aikido people can, their feet can be in the wrong place. I mean, it can literally be all wrong sure. and, and you'll see somebody do this incredible flip or, you know, like, holy cow, how did that happen? Well, it was the UK. It sure wasn't the nugget. Right. You know, uh, at, at, since our discussion last week, I, I wanted to think of an example of going through the physical and how it affects the mental and even the spiritual. And that is, imagine you, you train and you can pick the martial art. It can be Aikido or anything, but you get to that point and you physically train and you build a certain level of true confidence that you know you can what you can handle in terms of um, physically. So, somebody who's attacking you, somebody that, that's shoving you, trying to manhandle you and dominate you physically using whatever tools that they want to use. When you can, I don't want to say complete because you, you never complete that layer. But when you dwell in that layer long enough and you really get a handle of, I know what I can handle. Mm -hmm. And granted, there's always the surprise of you run across somebody, you, you underestimate what they're about. But when you really know yourself, this is where I connect it to Sun Tzu. And you really know yourself, you have half of that equation. And that is when you get to a confrontation where you understand what you're that you've got a high level of capability and now let's put a real world situation to it where you're suddenly confronted by somebody who's agitated they're angry and they're focusing it on you and it starts to go physical and we'll pause it right at that moment and you start to think about what how could this come out what am i capable of doing that will stop this person from furthering their aggression upon me or making a victim out of me and when you say i'm capable you now are looking, now you're in the mental area where you're thinking, what should I do? Do I need to just run and run away? Do I, you know, am I capable of anything? If you never go through that physical layer and you don't have that understanding of what you truly are capable of, you really only have two options. One is run away and two is basically submit or get your ass kicked. That, okay. That's all you have. Okay. And so, but when you build that physical competence, you at least see that there's another possibility in there. And that is that you can put an end to this right away or, or at least intervene with it. Now, as you start to think through, well, okay, what are different possibilities of this? Whether this is perhaps saving somebody, an innocent person from being victimized or maybe even saving yourself from being victimized. Now it gets to the point where you realize I've got some options. It's not to say you're going to turn into some crusader and go beating everybody up when, you know, they, they seem to be giving you some resistance, resistance. but you, you but put you, it, you put what, it. What am I getting an echo here? Okay. Um, sorry about that. But once you start to realize your own capability, I think the next thing is you get to a spiritual level where you realize what's my obligation as a human being is my obligation to help people that need help when I'm, I know I'm capable of it. To me, we're starting, that starts to get into where a true warrior, the heart of, of a true warrior is. And I'm not talking about a warmonger, somebody who craves violence. I'm talking about somebody who their role in society is to protect their community, their family, themselves, um, and to, to maintain or establish peace. Like, to me, that's what warriors have been throughout society. And by warrior, I don't mean a soldier, just somebody who's hired by their government to go fight. I'm talking about any individual that that faces and deals with conflict in order to establish peace. So maybe that's kind of a big ball to wrap it up in. But that to me, without the physical layer, all you're really doing is imagining yourself as 
a peacekeeper or as a, a warrior, whatever, whatever term you'd want to put to that, but you're just kind of being a poser that you don't have anything to back it up. And that's the concern I would have for anybody that feels like they want to kind of skirt around the physical layer to get to that cool mental. I want to be a peaceful warrior sort of spirituality thing, but without the physical there's, it's just a paper tiger. There's nothing really there. Well, Tristan test some of those guys who supposedly reach that level. Mm -hmm. And you find it in, you know, I, I do Zazen and you find this in meditation world too. They'll tell you, you know, they'll, you know, sometimes I teach meditation in different areas or I'd meditate mm -hmm. with different people. Um, and sometimes either um, in uh, underprivileged neighborhoods and you would hear people, you know, at time discussing meditation saying, well, oh, they should just, you know, meditate through the problems. And I'm like, well, look, if you're in poverty, if you live in a dangerous neighborhood, if you're going to a crappy school, maybe zenning your way through it ain't going to work, you know? And these are people who never been tested. They live in the suburbs. They live in a nice place. Pull a gun on them and let's see them zen through it, you know? Let them zen, you know, at when you're uh, worried of when you're going to a cruddy school and you're trying to keep your grades up. And so I don't give out, you know, fake advice. I give out things that should work as an instructor and whether I teach my kids or I teach anyone else, you know, I try to give things that are practical and work. And you mentioned about, you know, a center, right? Chushing. This is, if you look at a picture of O-Sensei, one of the more famous ones is the drawing of him with kind of the belly and the glow behind him. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Buddha, you're, they're often represented with a large belly and ryan knows this is chushin right and a hot adekitaru or right ryan so you made your center and the only way you can make your center is through that hard training right um is is going yeah, through that day, hard physical training that's where it comes from when you need to pull it out that's the area it comes from it does come, come from deep down inside in your, in your center it does right and, but I did want to mention that there's really Mitsu Chushin, right? There's three, just like there's three parts to martial arts. Well, we make the other two, right, through the physical Chushin, right? We can, that's unavoidable, right? But to make the mental or the spiritual, right? Um, so let's say, like, I've seen guys, you know, in neighborhoods in Chicago or New York, tough dudes, and that, you know, they have that kind of martial attitude never trained in a dojo before, only trained a little bit, but they got it the hard way, right? Right on the street. And you can see that look, like you were saying, that look and eye, how they carry themselves. And I have a good friend of mine who has a dojo in Spanish Harlem, in uh, Jeet Kune Do dojo in Spanish Harlem, right? Right on 117th, right? So, and he's had it there for almost 20 years, like 17, 18 years, so before it started to change. And it's still a rough place, Spanish Harlem. And he would say, you know, I'd see some of the tough kids in his class. I'm like, wow, these are tough kids. He goes, yeah, he goes, you see those gangsters down the street? And he goes, if you want to see them cry, just ask them about their dad. And uh, right, because they're open emotionally. They haven't, they haven't gotten that center emotionally because you can only make that kind of real heart center, your emotional center through good training there, through correct training. And you can't get that being abused or whatever else. Dojos aren't those places, right? Dojos a safe place to be pushed, to, to, to increase your levels. Gangs and, and violence is, you know, not a safe place to get those same uh, techniques. So a dojo is a safe place for us to push ourselves physically to get those same, that eye of the tiger, that, you know, that killer instinct to develop that. Because otherwise, how can you develop that in a nice suburb? How could you develop that when there's absolutely no need in your life? I had to develop this because I was a skinny kid in some rough neighborhoods in Chicago. And I saw right away, I better do something. Right? I mean... I walked around most of my adulthood between, you know, 130, 135 pounds. So, right. you know, you better carry something. And that was in the martial arts world or in Chicago or places I worked. 
and um, and so you have so a dojo is a safe place for regular folk to push their physicality, their mentality, or their spirituality in a safe place, including those who I've seen a lot of rough guys come in who had that look. And then you see them soften up. You see them take care of other people. They love the etiquette the most. Um, and you find intellectuals who maybe aren't the best physical guys or women, but you see them push, be hard on me. You know, I used to have this stiff old guy. He was, he's actually my, my Zen teacher. I met him in Aikido in Chicago. And uh, he came from New York. He was training in Aikido with Toei Sensei. And he was so stiff. And he, he had to be about 55 or 50. He's 50 years old and super stiff, but super strong. And he, he'd come up to me. Oh, my gosh, you must throw me hard. And I'd throw him. And he would take horrible look at me. And uh, we would do this again. He'd do it again. And then he asked me during cleaning time, well, what can I clean? Let me clean the toilets. And that's when I knew he was for real. Because he wanted the lowest job you can get. Nobody wanted to clean the dojo toilets. He volunteered. So he was trying to push himself being a Zen master in every way he could. And I think that's what martial arts is. And the dojo is the place to do it. Uh, good points. Um, I know for, for me, I, a long time people will advocate doing some type of meditation. And for me, the movement has been the meditation. I've always found that that calm in being that I have a task to do, or I'm trying to hone my art or my fighting or my technique or, you know, what have you, it's a place to put everything else aside. Like that's the meditative part to me. It's within the physical. It's not outside of it or surrounding it. It's, it's one, it's inseparably two different things that are one. What would you say about that Rayon? Can I just, I just want to quickly follow up on, on what DJ said. Sure. And um, I mentioned this to you earlier, or well, in our previous podcast, Tristan, but the, the tummy doesn't lie, right? You remember That's that. That's the beauty of it. You only have in your toolbox what you have in your toolbox. You can fake it. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, people say like, you know, especially I'm involved in the film industry here in Japan. And it's like, you know, fake it till you make it. And you can fake it a certain way or, or, or for a certain amount of time. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to produce the goods at some point in time. Martial arts, job, life, whatever. And I've had a bunch of old guys. Well, not only old guys, but a bunch of people at Hombu stand in front of me and try and stop me and put their face out and you can't do the technique. And I'm just, you know, like the good, the good martial artist in me just goes, yeah, okay. Okay, man. But, you know, going back to my pro wrestling training, the absolute greatest thing that has ever happened in my life is being pushed to breaking limit, being pushed to the point where you think you cannot go anymore. And then you go more and you're like, wow, I did it. And it's the, it's the most in, single, most incredible feeling as a human being that you can, Oh my God, I did it. And that, that you don't have to be a hardcore professional athlete to, to get to that level, your own level of where your breaking point is different for everybody. You know, for some of these older ladies who do Aikido, obviously we don't expect that or from the older men, but we expect a little bit more. Do it to your best of your ability and then try and do it just a little bit more and see how you go. And I still, I still come across so many people in my Aikido training who are not willing to go that extra step. And this is something that is a massive pet hate of mine. I guess this is the best word to say is we need to get out of our comfort zones and really try to develop ourselves physically better because I think the mentality will come after you have pushed yourself just a little bit more than you're comfortable with. It does, you know, and, and when I competed, 
one of the things that I I found to love was that that discomfort. And DJ mentioned it earlier, staying out of the comfort zone. If you're in your comfort zone, you will not ever go to the next rung on the ladder. You'll just sit there and you'll either languish or you, you get worse or you, at best you'll hang at a plateau. But when you push yourself into that that uncomfortable zone and to go a little bit past, and this is where I think people that are not exposed to this process of of improving yourself often get scared of getting that into that uncomfort zone or that discomfort zone. They're frightened. They don't want either the humiliation or the uh, bruise to the ego or whatever. And it doesn't really matter what, whether it's just raw fear. That's exactly it. It doesn't matter which, which one it is. It's all of it's going to be counterproductive to your own development. And it's, I don't really care for hearing the justifications of why somebody can't or they don't want to or they won't or whatever. All of those things is that what they call about messaging when you tell yourself that you suck and you're awful and you'll never get better at this and you're wasting your time and you know you bombard yourself with that and you can some you you wind it's a prison of your own making. And when you throw the door open and you say, give me the discomfort, give me a little bit of that, I think the the careful thing is to make sure that those rungs on the ladder are not spaced so far apart that you can't get to the next one. Right. You can't make your training so, t so difficult that you, you've suddenly realized that you're, you're completely wasting your time. You're frustrating yourself. But if you make those small incremental improvements, get a little uncomfortable and then conquer it, then make yourself a little bit more uncomfortable. You conquer that. Like you're climbing that ladder one rung at a time uh and and building yourself and and this is even just a language i i would hope that more aikido people would start to warm up to and it's like it's not about just in, engaging in competition it's about challenging yourself to go beyond where your limits are and and putting yourself in that uncomfortable zone on purpose so that you can conquer it and you know yeah you're conquering it for yourself so that you know masakatsu agatsu you know, applies. That is exactly where it applies. But if you never try to conquer your own fears and demons and the things that are holding you back, you'll never advance. And well, coming up with excuses of why you never did it is just not acceptable. It's not, not going to Well, it's not martial arts. And that's the main point I wanted to say is like, definitionally, that expansion is necessary. Aikido does not live in its own world. Right. It follows the same uh, rules as anything else. Mm -hmm. And if you um, and if you're practicing martial arts without any expansion, if you go to the gym, you got to put more weights on to get bigger. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a faster runner, you got to push yourself. And so Aikido fits squarely into all of that. It's not magic. And so if people are saying something else, well, then that becomes the realm of magic. And that's not what you should be doing in a dojo. Yep. Well, we got just a couple minutes left, so let's uh, wrap up with some final thoughts. Um, DJ, let's start with you. You have anything to you want to conclude with? Well, no. I mean, I think it's been great. I just wanted to mention, though, is that you know, if people have questions like this, they should be able to ask their instructors because this sounds. I've seen people do it, but I, these are the same people who never asked a teacher because every single shihan, every single sensei that I've met in Japan, in Judo, Karate, Aikido, Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, all said the same thing. Now, some of them were older and frail. Some of them were young and strong, but they all gave me the same answers. Whether, you know, you must work hard, you must push yourself and you can push yourself in lots of different ways, but you got to push. Excellent point. Brian? <clears throat> I said to you last time, I don't think Aikido has to change. I think the way of training has to change. When I was coming up doing karate, you will block. And if your hips were an inch out, your sensei would come over and he'd move your hips. He'd touch, he'd put your hands and he'd move it this way. He'd fix your block. He'd fix your kick. He'd fix everything. And the only problem I have with the Aikido is that it's it's, you know, for lack of better expression, monkey see, monkey do. I just wish there was a little bit more learning. 
I know this is a traditional martial arts thing. We can get into that maybe on another podcast, but I somehow wish that there's a little bit more learning and a little less showing would be one way to get onto the road of, of this topic that we covered today. Absolutely. You know, I love that. I love what DJ mentioned about mentioning, talking to your instructors. I think communication is the solution to so many problems. And whether it's an instructor or, or a dojo cho or somebody who's in charge of their dojo, if students come in and remain silent and never express what they want from the art or what they're interested in, then there will be no real change or no real shift. And this, the teacher cannot cater to you. If you're the, if you're the student and you're interested in this, take your, take your instructor aside and privately say, Hey, this is what I'm interested in. Worst case is they can say, well, I appreciate that, but that's not really what we're doing. And they've let you know, and you can find somebody who is interested in teaching you what you would like. But I think more often than not, instructors love hearing what their students are interested in and will stray class towards what you what you want to learn. And I think they talk about this in, in uh, quantum theory, quantum mechanics about there's no such thing as an observer who does not affect the universe around them. Because you're in, in a class, you're in that room, you will affect that group. And if it's your interest to, to study the martial aspects of Aikido and to build a, a strong part of that in you, you will start to affect the group that way. And it's just easier when you, when you go to your instructor and just openly say, hey, here's what I'm interested in. Um, you know, it's, there's nothing to be ashamed about. I know that the Japanese authority kind of method of, of uh, you know, the hierarchical situation with organizations and dojos tends to be a little intimidating. And oftentimes students feel like, well, I'm just insignificant here. But I think it's important to, to communicate through that, that and let your instructors know what you're interested in. Um, and that's, that's, I think, where Aikido will start. On to that change. point. Yeah. On that point, it was always, when I was coming up, it was like, well, I need to make myself right. significant because I felt that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't wait to get up the ranks, but at the same time, I knew, you know, mm -hmm. you can't just go along for the free ride. Right. And th this applies not only to the brand new student or the intermediate student, but the uh, brown belt, black belt, the assistant instructor, you're one of the instructors in a group. If you feel like you want your Aikido to, to strengthen and you, and you want to be part of that, get in a conversation with your dojo cho or, or, you know, even the Shihan of your organization, if you run your own dojo, um, yeah. you know, have, have this conversation because I, I do think that, that people are going to, are drawn to practical things. No one wants to study, you know, auto mechanic skills with a mechanic that doesn't know how to fix a car. They're, they're going to go to somebody who does. And that's, that's just a pure on, um, I think a marketing issue that, that Aikido has, but, um, well, cool. This has been a great conversation. I, I wish I could stick around longer, but uh, I, I do need to go. But thank you very much, guys. Uh, Ryan, thank you for introducing me to DJ. We've had such a great conversation, yeah. not only tonight, but the you know when we we chatted on the phone earlier this week. So yeah, this this hour has been like a, a flashback of the last twelve years of my life <laughs> <laughs> because I would get this kind of talk while we're training off sure. on and off the mats. Yep. Um, yeah, and one of the reasons I love this podcast is, that, is I can talk about stuff and spend time at it. When uh, when you're on the mats, you want to get physical, but you can't do both. <laughs> one thing that I wanted to quickly mention before uh, in the intro, and I forgot, was that when I first got to Yokota Sensei's class, I was one of those guys who could, you know, I could look, but I couldn't really see. Mm -hmm. I was watching Sensei's technique, but I couldn't really see what he was doing. Mm -hmm. like I could like I was I could look at him, but I couldn't see. And that's where like DJ came in as so important because he was like my my Yakota translator. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, Sensei really means this. And when he's doing this, it also means this. This is the practical, this is the Aikido. So I was very fortunate to have um DJ there to to show me physically, mentally everything it's you know this is it's just so important to have this relationship with a, a senpai 
Nice. DJ, I'll give you the last word, my friend. Well, that's, you know, Ryan just said it and, you know, and you too, Tristan, about asking people and those relationships. The What makes martial arts special is that it's, you know, it's different ages. It's adults and kids. It's different. You know, you have a white belt. You can have a nanadan on the mat, seventh dan on the mat. And so, and everyone working together. And so it's adult continuing education. And why would you go to class and not ask a question? You know, why wouldn't you develop? So developing these relationships is part of martial arts because you cannot do it alone. You need senpai, you need kohai, you need uh, other people of your level, right? Uh, Dokusei or dohai, you know, you need those people. And so if, if I could say anything is I would tell people, don't try to do it alone. Right. Reach out, whether it's the Internet or best is do it in person because mm -hmm. martial arts is still taught person to person. But reach out, you know, and try to make those relationships for long term growth. That's a great point to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I know this has been a little challenging with uh, Ryan being over in Japan and uh, DJ and I being over here in the middle of the U.S. But uh, I'm really glad we could work this out. and It's been fun. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. too. Thanks, guys. Have a very good night, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training.